Um, I wanted to ask you about the coordination deal that Secretary Kerry and Foreman and Minister Labrov were discussing today. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering if you can give us any update on <coughs> how those conversations are going, and also if um, you can confirm that kind of coordination between Russia and the U.S. on airstrikes is part of that deal beyond <coughs> the deconflection that we've talked about pre previously. Well, we certainly know that Russia is uh, – has expressed some interest in greater military uh, cooperation. Uh, the concern that we have expressed is that um, too much of the time and attention of the Russian military is being devoted to propping up the Assad regime, uh, and in some cases aiding and abetting the horrific tactics of the Assad regime. We know that government military assets, including aircraft, with the full support of the Russians and the Iranians, have been used to target civilians and to target medical facilities. It's beyond the pale. So as a practical matter, the actions that we've seen from the Assad regime are indefensible from a moral perspective. But for people who aren't interested in morality, even as a practical matter, they only put off the kind of solution that even the Russians themselves acknowledge is necessary to deal with the situation inside of Syria. As long as Russia is willing to support the Assad regime's murderous military tactics that often claims the lives of innocent women and children, the more difficult it is for a political solution to be reached. It's also more difficult for humanitarian relief to be delivered to these communities um, that so badly need it. So that's the, that's the, the, the crux of the problem here. And I recognize that it is a problem for the United States and that it has prevented um, the kind of uh, political progress that we'd like to see in, inside of Syria. But it's an even bigger problem for the Russians, primarily because it calls into question their integrity and their effectiveness to deal with the puppet regime that they're maintaining in Syria. But it also raises questions because there's an internal contradiction in their strategy that they have failed to resolve. They say that a political transition is necessary, but yet they are deeply invested in propping up the Assad regime. And the more they prop up the, the Assad regime, the more difficult it is to affect the political transition. So I recognize that this has been an impediment to the United States making progress in the direction that we would like to see, which is an end to the violence inside of Syria, trying to get the chaos under control. Uh, and thereby make it more difficult for uh, extremist organizations to operate there. But because of the Russians and because of their inability or their refusal to exercise some influence uh, over the Assad regime, it's only continued to fuel the kind of extremism that the Russians, I think, are rightly worried about. So. This is all the subject of ongoing discussion uh, between uh, Secretary Kerry and um, his Russian counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Um, I, I don't have a detailed update on those conversations to, to share with you primarily because, uh, at least as uh, I learned shortly before I walked out here, they're still talking. Um, but we've been clear about what it is that we need to see. Uh, and what we need to see is we need to see a clear commitment demonstrated in real life on the ground um, that the Russians and the Syrian government uh, are willing to live up to the commitments that they made in the context of the cessation of hostilities almost six months ago now. I guess I'm trying to understand how to read that wind up, whether it was just sort of a history of the conflict in Syria or if it was an indication that you that the talks are going in a direction where you don't think that the Russians and the Assad regime are making the type, the type of concessions that you would need to see 
for this type of military agreement? Well, again, I, 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 I probably don't speak the kind of uh, blunt um, diplomatic, I, I, let me say it this way, I probably don't speak the kind of nuanced diplomatic talk that uh, uh, may be valued in other um, agencies. But we've been pretty clear about this. And we're not seeking concessions. We're seeking the Russian government living up to the commitments that they've made. They've made commitments in the context of a cessation of hostilities. They made those commitments six months ago. And for several weeks, there was a lot of skepticism when they initially made those commitments about their willingness or their ability to follow through on them. And I think everyone was pleasantly surprised. There did seem to be a commitment on the part of the Russians, both in terms of their own activities and both in terms of using their influence with the Assad regime to scale back military activities in a way that allowed for much improved, though not perfect, humanitarian access and created space for diplomatic and political negotiations. But over the last several months, we've seen the commitment to the cessation of hostilities fray in far too many communities, particularly around Aleppo. Uh, and that has led to a situation where the humanitarian situation that was already terrible has somehow gotten even worse. The political talks uh, are struggling, if, if they're doing anything. And the Russian activities only fuel extremism in that country. Now, because of the efforts of the United States and our counter-ISIL coalition, we've been able to address uh, a lot of that. Uh, and ISIL is under a lot of pressure uh, in Syria. Uh, and we've made important progress on the ground against ISIL uh, in Syria. But that's come in spite of the actions of the Russians, who continue to engage in activities that only fuel extremism. So, um, so it's, a, it's a complicated situation right now. I would acknowledge that. Uh, and again, there are negative consequences for the United States because of the inability of the Russians to live up to their commitments. But the negative consequences for the Russians themselves are much greater. Uh, and it's appealing to that self-interest. So that's why, I, I guess that's a long answer to your question. The point is, that's why I'd make the case to you that uh, we're not describing these as concessions on the part of the Russians. This is about living up to commitments that they made that are con entirely consistent with their own self-interest. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, for reasons I think that only the Russians themselves can explain, they've refused to do that.